is Tariq Talk. Your host, Tariq Mendez, takes you on a journey with guests from all around the world. Broadcasting around the world. Around the world. This is Tariq Talk. All right, hey guys, today I'm here with Jonathan Levine. Did I get that right? Good enough. Perfect. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm very, very much looking forward to this podcast. Um, so yeah, do you want to start by telling us a little, a little bit about yourself? Yeah, um, my name is Jonathan Levine, and I am. Gosh, I guess I call myself. I'm. I'm people know me as a gallerist because mm-hmm. I had a gallery for 18 years. Um, these days, I kind of call myself a creative entrepreneur who works in the visual arts. Um, you know, my basic story is I was an independent curator in New York City for about five years. This was around 95 to 2000, 2001. And then I opened a gallery in a town called New Hope, PA, and that was called Tin Man Alley. And I had that for about two years, and then I moved it to Philly, which was about 40 minutes from there. And I had it there for about two years. And then in 2005, I moved up here, back up here to New York, and I opened a gallery in Chelsea uh, in 2005. That was called the Jonathan Levine Gallery. At one point, I had two galleries um, in Chelsea and had that for 12 years. And then at one point, I moved here to Jersey City and had a, the same gallery. We changed the name of Jonathan Levine Projects because we were sort of changing our business model. And uh, just before COVID, I uh, closed my physical space, and now I just function um, online as, I uh, gosh, you know, uh, I just kind of do a variety of projects. I don't mm-hmm. really have a, like a focus on like kind of a direction I'm going. I predominantly sell secondary market work, but I also represent a couple artists, and I represent an artist named Kum Kum Fernando exclusively. So he and I are always doing projects, which keeps me very busy. Um, but you know, I could do art fairs, or I work with uh, a variety of other creative partners, and f- with a variety of other different kind of projects. So I leave it kind of open. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. And how how did you get into opening your own like physical space in Chelsea? Uh, so uh, back in around 1995, I was living in downtown Jersey City, just four blocks from here. And I had been out of school for a while. I graduated from Montclair State with an art degree. Um, but I was always like sort of a creative person. I, I was a really mediocre visual artist. I got a degree in sculpture. And uh, I used to draw, try to draw comics, and I used to try to illustrate. But I have this history of putting out, just being a maker in some sorts of, putting out music magazines, booking, punk, come out of the punk scene out of a Trent, mm-hmm. where I'm from, Trent, New Jersey. Oh, nice. Um, booking shows, playing in bands, and just as a little kid, just as a teen, make I was a maker. I used to sew. Um, I was in the theater. I just was like this all around creative. But I was really heavily involved in sort of underground culture, music culture, as uh, I got into my teens, and this is like mm-hmm. mid-80s. Um, so I stayed sort of just completely absorbed in that and collecting, you know, self-published magazines, comic books, going to see underground music. And at that time, I was really into collecting uh, underground comics, and I was into these illustrators that did this kind of very unusual work. They had different... They just drew differently than they didn't make typical comic book uh, characters that you'd see like in a Marvel comic or something. It was the the work was super stylized, and so I started to put together art exhibitions in bars um, as just because I went to share the work and I was super excited about it. I was a super geek, oh, wow. and uh, with this kind of work, and I started to curate at a Mac this place called Maxwell's that was in Hoboken. It doesn't exist anymore, but it was this kind of very well-known music venue very well-known nationally so i put on like you know uh monthly shows there and then i ended up curating at cbgb's gallery cbg is a famous punk rock oh wow and they had the gallery next door and i sort of my business kind of grew 
out of this scene that was coming up that they would call lowbrow or pop surrealism and magazines mm -hmm. like Juxtapose were covering it. So I was like very much involved in that scene before it even became a yeah, thing. Yeah, it happened, yeah. So I did that for a while, I just put on shows and bars and things and then uh, I had, basically I was at, at, in debt and I moved back to my mom's house in Trenton. I started working at my friend's bagel shop trying to figure out what I was gonna do. And after about two years, I was like, all right, I guess I'm gonna try to open a business. And I really wasn't, I didn't 100% wanna do it. Mm -hmm. Because I still had these ideas of, oh, maybe I'll be a rock star. I play drums, by the way. I'm oh, nice. I play band, too. That's so I, I do that now. Um, and I was like, oh, maybe I'll be a rock star, which, you know, or maybe I'll be an actor, even though I don't act. And, <laughs> you know, and I just was very, you know, cautious about committing to something. But finally, I was like, all right, I'm going to open this art gallery. I'm going to give it a shot. And I opened this gallery in... Because I really liked it. I was just kind of addicted to it, and I seemingly yeah. was good at it. And, you know, curating, and I started to sell work, and I seemed to have a good eye. And I was very, very excited about being connected to this larger community. At this point, I knew artists all over the country, and I was connected to this with West Coast scene, and I was making all these cool friends. And so I opened this space in this, like, little tourist town in a basement and rent was like $500 a month so oh, it was wow. really cheap that's amazing so that's how I started and then I you know people started to be online more and I put a website online and I basically my business just took off from there I built it from there um, I didn't plan on being an art dealer I didn't know how long I was gonna be one I didn't know I would be 55 years old that which is how old I am now doing this now no clue. I was just kind of trying to find some kind of way to make a living and be happy in the arts. And I just don't do well working for other people. Mm -hmm. I'm just very like kind of a purist and I felt like I needed to do something that I thought was important. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how it happened. That's the that's the short version of the story. <laughs> no, no, it's <laughs> amazing. Know? And did you ever get to like see any like legends or like you said, like um, at Maxwell and like CB, how do you pronounce it? CB, CBGBs? CBG. I can never, English is my second language. I can never say that, but I know that place. Did you ever get to see like anything cool happen? In, well, I mean, I saw a time? lot of, I mean, I knew Hilly Crystal who was the owner and they ended up making a biopic about him. Uh, um, I remember one night I was there and I was just there working a show. I don't know what show I had up there, but it was the first, I think it was one of the first music performances of John Lennon's youngest son, Sean. Oh, wow. Performing. That's so dope. He was like 21, 22, 23, something like that. And so he's there walking around, which is freaking me out, but Yoko Ono standing next to me. No way. At the bar, and there's like nobody else there. Yeah. Um, but you would just have random people walk in there. I remember Spike Lee walked in there one time because he was... Uh, they ended up filming this movie, Son of Sam, mm -hmm. um, and they used CBGBs as a, a, a location. Occasionally, you would just see like famous people come in there just because it was CBGBs. Yeah, you know? um, that's amazing. I would, you know, I'd venture to say actually, though. I mean, you. Would, I remember back then you would see someone like the, the director Jim Jarmusch walking around because he mm -hmm. lived down there. Um, you know, I mean, I would, I. Truth be told, I probably had way more like famous people come into my gallery mm -hmm. than I did at that point. You yeah. Know? Um, but that's always a little strange. But, you know, I saw a lot of punk rock bands there. I was there, you know, I that's saw so cool. what people consider whatever legends, depending on. Yeah. You know, I mean, I wasn't there in the in the 70s when it was, you know. Yeah. The peak. Yeah. You know, when the talking heads were there and Blondie was there and all that. Yeah, occasionally I'd see Patti Smith there, who was like kind of well known from there. Um, you would see people, yeah, yeah, sure. And when you were curating those shows, did you ever think like like you were doing them? Did you think in the future like, oh, I could you know open my own space? Like yeah, was that no, something I you was, were I was dreaming conscious? of that. But the problem was is that to be a gallerist, you usually need a lot of money. Mm -hmm. 
and I didn't have a lot of money, mm-hmm. so I didn't come from money. Um, and most, not all, but most gallerists have money, and they have a lot of money because it's really risky. And quite yeah. frankly, you're going to lose money most of the time. Yeah. Um, depending on how you approach it, but it's a very, very, very difficult business. And so, you know, I just never even approached it that way because I was such a, just like a purist and I was just like, I'm very idealistic. So that's why I ended up, my plan had been like, I'll move back down to my parents' house and open a gallery in Philly, build that up and come back to New York. And that's pretty much what I did. But if it wasn't because I had, because of the internet and it wasn't for the fact that I sort of was ahead of the curve mm-hmm. for so long, I don't know that I would have been able to do it. Yeah. But I was really dedicated and I took made a lot of sacrifices. But truth is, I really wasn't interested in doing working for anybody else. Yeah. And there are points of time in all that when I was trying to get to where I was, where I was super miserable mm-hmm. and really unhappy and I wasn't hadn't been successful, so I couldn't see my you know, you can dream of being successful, but Successful in the sense that, you know, whatever, you're able to do what it is you want to do for a living and be, and, and make a decent living. Yeah, of it. And then, you know, be, you know, and also a, a piece of that, what I wanted, and it's different for everyone, you know, be recognized for it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was thinking that, but the crazy thing is, as I was having that experience, the world kept changing around me. So my original idea about it, versus the reality of the world today are two different things. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I approach it differently. Yeah. Um, So. And you mentioned, at what year did you establish the website? Because I think that's like so groundbreaking. Yeah, you know, I I think we, the website went up, I'll never forget this, it was like, it was 2001, it was maybe six months after I had opened my first, my my gallery. And back then it was, took forever to get pictures up and all that. I remember I had this show up and I had to show up with this artist, Glenn Barr. Glenn Barr and Chris Mars were the two artists, two-person show. And I remember someone emailed me out of the blue from Texas, and they bought a $3,000 painting off me. And oh, I was wow. like, holy crap. And did you like? Did you know that was like possible with a website? Or did you think, I oh, it was just... I never had that experience. The, no. the truth is, early, earlier on, like back in the couple years earlier, mm-hmm. I had some friends who were putting artwork on, online, and people were like, yeah, people were doing it, but in this very crude way. Mm-hmm. And they're like, people don't feel comfortable buying work offline. Yeah. Well, that changed. Yeah. And if it wasn't for the internet, I don't know that I would have ever been in business. Mm -hmm. Um, It makes everything real easy for us all. Like if we had to do the things that we need to, we need to do now to to do those. If we had to go through the steps and go through all the time and energy just to sell one painting. A lot of people wouldn't be doing it. It's yeah. so incredibly easy now yeah. um, in all capacities. So like I sell work, I, I, what's called secondary market, which a lot of people don't know what that is. That's basically me reselling work, work that maybe I sold to someone or something, a piece they bought from someone else, and I resell it for them. That's the secondary market. Mm-hmm. And the way I typically do that is I don't take the work physically on consignment. It stays with them. Mm-hmm. I just am, we have a contract. And for a certain amount of time, I get them to give me good images. If they're, if the images, oftentimes the images are already floating around online. And when we sell the work, I can basically just, depending where they are, um, and depending on the value of the work, et cetera, either just send them over to the local FedEx. Mm -hmm. FedEx has art boxes. Call the FedEx place. Give them my account number. Little packet. I give them the information. And they get shipped off to somebody. Simple as that. Smooth and simple. You couldn't do that no. 20 years ago. No. No way. You know? And this is 2001. Now we're... Was that... Tw- 2001. Now we're... Tw- 2000 is 22. Was that 22 years ago? I think so, yeah. Um, it would never be like that. Um, you didn't have these, these basically out-of-the-box platforms that you can build websites for nothing and put... You, you couldn't take pictures these days you can take a picture on your phone as good as a professional photographer if you know what you're doing um it's really quite seamless but the flip side of that is it's much more competitive yeah so 
That's yeah. that's the you know the trade off. You know now you have all these artists. Everyone's on Instagram. They don't even need a website anymore. Um, and everyone's stuff looks really professional. They've read all the stuff. They're creating all this content. You're all content creators basically, mm-hmm. and successful artists are. And you know there it is. But there's mil- thousands of people, millions of people doing it. Whereas before you weren't, you didn't have. There that. was only select a few, yeah. Yeah, you know, like you had to. That's why people count on the galleries. People don't count on galleries anymore. Yeah. So that, that's one of the big shifts that happened in the market. Yeah. And how was it? Um, I think I'm curious. Like when you opened your first location in Chelsea in 2005, how was New York then to now? Well, it's different. Is it extremely different? It might be in a subtle way. The difference is that everybody lives their life on a phone Mm -hmm. and not in person. New York itself has gotten more expensive, seemingly more crowded. Chelsea, where I was, was just starting to get its stride. There weren't, if you go into Chelsea now, West Chelsea, uh, where all the galleries are, all you see are all these apartment buildings, sky rises, all these create. That wasn't there. Yeah. It was all just like, there was a little bit of that, but it was all just like old warehouses mm-hmm. and stuff. Um, they got converted into apartments. Yeah, or they just built new buildings. Okay. You know, they knock stuff down, yeah. um, depending on what it is. And, you know, so I don't know that people go out to openings as much. I actually ne- barely ever go to openings. I don't really walk around Chelsea anymore, but that's for different reasons. Um, it was really social. If you wanted to know about art, you had to read the art news, art news, art forum, um, whatever Art in America juxtapose. You had to read art magazines, or you had to read a handful of blogs. Mm-hmm. That is how you found out about work. I think Instagram really changed things. For me, you know, I don't, I, I. Having to constantly be putting stuff on Instagram is exhausting. We've got Facebook, Instagram, people are doing TikTok, which I don't do. Um, having to constantly create content and compete is exhausting. I personally preferred the way the market was around 2005 to 2010. I mm-hmm. preferred it. Yeah. Uh, because what I built on was the brand I had built was working for me. But when artists have more options and there's more, when people have more options, more artists to choose from, um, your business isn't going to do as well. And that was yeah. always the big complaint, though, was that the, the, the art market was the, the artists couldn't get into it. But it's very small. Yeah. There's only so many galleries. There's a reason for that, and it's because it's a very difficult business, and most people don't buy art. You know, if you're going to try to make a living as an artist, don't expect it to be easy and expect to be a business person, Mm -hmm. right? The idea of what it is to be a visual artist, I think, has changed. In what way do you think? I think most people who are younger visual artists see it as it's very commerce oriented. It's glossy, shiny, big big spaces, promoting and marketing, making tons of additions, getting your picture taken, looking beautiful, like being a celebrity sort of, but also being very focused on making money. Mm -hmm. And when I was growing up, or even when I was in my 20s, even in my early 30s, it wasn't like that. Yeah. What was it like? It was you just didn't have access because you didn't you couldn't just like you could only find out about things through a handful of like publications and it was about doing it because you really loved it and you sort mm-hmm. of like the whole more it was a little bit more romantic yeah I think it was more meaningful mm-hmm. more authentic too uh, absolutely more yeah. authentic I don't hold it to people I don't hold it against people and I. And I'm sure, and I'm sure I've worked with artists like this who are doing things in an incredibly commercial way. But don't pretend to take yourself so seriously when you're really just making product, and that's fine. But be honest about it. Yeah. Um, 
it's very different. Like, you know, when I was growing up, I was reading, you know, I was excited about the art world. And I wasn't really excited about the art world, actually. It felt very... The reason I opened my gallery is because I was showing very accessible work. Mm -hmm. And I found that the art world is classist. And it still is. And it's not something I'm particularly interested in. And I am kind of like a bulldog in a china shop. I still am. I'm like a Jersey guy, a working class Jersey guy, right? Uh, I grew, I'm half Jewish, but I was raised, I'm half Italian American. I was raised really Italian American, with raised by my mother and my grandparents are like off the boat. Could Whoa. barely read and write English, you know. But I, I'm very typical of a New Jersey person. I'm yeah. not unusual. I come from a city of people like yeah. me. But people like me are not in the art world. Or if they are, they have to change. Yeah. I'm not adapt. interested in that. Yeah. You know, like I'm still like sell out in a way. I don't like you're selling out. I just if you feel comfortable in that, great. That's just not my scene. Yeah. I'd rather just hang out with people in town. Just regular people. I mean I hang out with creatives. I'm just I'm not interested in that. And there's a lot of that. Sometimes it's fun. Yeah. Sometimes it's fun yeah. to go to fancy openings and there's lots of beautiful women and everyone's all dressed up and you wear a suit. Yeah. I could tell you some really fun stories, yeah. you know. But it's not accessible. Yeah. You know, wealth is not accessible. Yeah. You know what I like about you talking to you is that you say what everybody's thinking it, but they don't have the balls to say it out loud. Oh, I always say You're it. You're so eloquent. Like, I hear people's like saying, like whispering, like, oh, you know, this is what I think. But nobody has the ball to actually say no, that. No, I always say it, and I'm pretty straight up about it. And there's amazing. nobody, And I really turn a lot of people off in yeah. that world because I am the way I am. Yeah. But I don't care. Yeah. Because I don't need them. Like, the, the thing of it is, is I'm not, I don't live in New York. I live in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I've never lived in New York. Um, so yeah. when you had the gallery sp space, you were, like, commuting, as yeah, you I said, for 12 I years? every day. Oh, wow. Yeah. In and out? Yeah. Five wow. days a week. Wow. That's crazy. It's a pain in the ass. I can imagine. Yeah. During, like, rush hours, too? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's dedication. You should get, like, a prize for it's that. It's one of the reasons I didn't want to be in New York anymore. Yeah, I can imagine. I was just tired of it. It was, yeah. it was a grind. Um, I did it. I'm glad I did it. Um, I don't think that the art world is in New York anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it is still there, but you don't need to be there yeah. to do it. Um, and if you like it, great. If I was younger, I might really be into it, but I've always been a little claustrophobic. I am a born and bred Northeasterner. I'm the closest thing to kind of a New Yorker that you'll meet, yeah. even though I didn't wasn't raised in New York, because nobody in New York is from New York. Really. Yeah. Very few people are. The ones that are, are usually people who grew up on the Upper East Side, the Upper West Side, they have a lot of money. That's a whole different kind of New Yorker. Any, most of my friends, not that there's a lot, that were born and raised in like Brooklyn or something, they all live in Jersey. Yeah. Or like Long Island or Staten Island or something like that. It's too expensive. And that's what everybody's family did. At one point, my family lived in New York and they moved out to Jersey because that's what people did. They yeah. want more space, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, I still my whole family still lives here. All my friends are in the area. I don't need that, and I never really needed that. Um, it doesn't give me value. It doesn't yeah. make me feel good about myself. Um, so I didn't. I don't really need that. And I think it's important to. It was important for me to be a gallerist in New York City and be that guy for everybody else. So they could be like, oh, I could do that too. Yeah. I mean, anyone who's saying like, I don't come for money, I can't do that. That's just not true. That doesn't mean you're not going to have to deal with a bunch of BS. Yeah. It's attainable, but get yeah. ready for it. Yeah. You know, like, but you're going to have to deal. And whether you want to or not is a whole other story. But truth is, there's so many artists now that are just online. They never leave their house. They're making good livings, selling their work. Mm -hmm. That's why the gallery system is not what it used to be. So if for better or worse, the, it got, it did become de democratized, the industry as you want to call it, because now it's more of an industry. Yeah. I used to think of it as something very different. You To talk about the art world, you're talking about an industry. Now we're an industry. We're not this, I, you know, this idealistic idea, this idea that I had about, it used to be about who you knew and the, the relationships you built 
and the stories you made and the work you did together. And truth is, fortunately for me, I'm still really close friends with some a lot of founding members of people that are like around my age or slightly yeah. older than me um, that have an understanding of that, even though they may have gone on and yeah. become more successful. Um, so yeah. Like, what advice would you give to like entrepreneurs that, because the thing I'm talking to you, I love how like you kind of just like didn't really have a fear, just like dove right into. Um, like, what advice do you have? Because there's a lot of like young people that, you know, want to pursue what you did in a way. And they said, oh, you know, I don't know like what I'm thinking. I don't know how to do it. Like, what, what would you tell them? Well, entrepreneur is a good thing. You mean being an artist or being an art dealer? I would say being an art dealer. An art dealer, dealer. What I would say is, don't do it. <laughs> 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 I think it is. I think if this is what I tell people because I still I mentor some younger mm -hmm. gallerists, and everyone does it for a different reason. There's mm -hmm. this idea about it. People talk about the galleries as if they're all the same. Yeah, and they're not. They're all completely different. They all have completely different motivations, different location, different client base, different vision, different amounts of resources i.e. money they're all completely different yeah um what i would say is if you don't have a lot of money you can still do it but expect to work really hard and scrap it out it is really hard um and there isn't in these days i mean you can go to a school and get a degree in arts management but they don't they don't really teach you yeah these things um so the advice I'd have is like, whether I tell you not to do it or do it, you're gonna do it anyway. Cause you, like I did it because I had a calling. Yeah. Or. And did I, you always feel like, it seems like you had like an intuition. Do you, would you agree with that? An intuition about what? Just like in business, like. Oh yeah, you know? yeah, I have a, a, what I would say about myself is I have a really strong business acumen. Mm -hmm. I didn't want it. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to have it. Uh -huh. I didn't want it to be create. I wanted to be a really talented creative mm -hmm. in terms of a talented visual artist, a talented musician, talented actor, just something, yeah. right? I was always very entrepreneurial and I was always good with that. And it is something that I have, but it wasn't something I wanted. It took me a long time to go like, okay, this is what you're going to do. Yeah. You're not going to do this other thing. It actually worked out for me though because people like you would be like, hey, you want to come over and do a podcast? Yeah. So I actually ended up getting some of the things I wanted from. That's pretty nice. You know, yeah, it's yeah. worked out good, you know. But uh, I would, I mean, you have to have, have good business acumen if you mm -hmm. want to do well. Yeah. Or you have to, you know, you, if you have really bad business acumen, you're not going to do well. Yeah. Um, you have to be somewhat entrepreneurial. You have to be creative thinker. Um, there's a lot, all sorts of things that fell into place that made me good at it, what I'm doing. But again, it, didn't, it wasn't like I was like, this is what I want to do. When I grow up, I want to be an art dealer. Like, who wants to do that? Yeah. Unless you grow up in some, <laughs> like, it, it's yeah. not like my family still, they would come to the openings, all the openings, and yeah. like family still is like, Jonathan, how's it going with your studio? They'd always uh, call it a studio. I'm like, it's an Art, art gallery. gallery. <laughs> they still think my mother. I joke with her. She's like, I'm like, we're recently we're talking about it in some capacity, and she was asking me, she's like, oh, does so and so understand what you do? Blah blah blah. I'm like, mom, you don't even understand what I do. She's like, I know. <laughs> we just kind of laughed about That's it. That's so know? cute. Um, but I think if you're young and you want to do this, you just go and do it, and you figure it out, and basically you develop good relationships with yeah. other people. You find like. I found some mentors and I really scraped and then I mentored a lot of people. I don't really do that now, mm -hmm. to be honest with you, because it kind of bit me in the ass. Um, but it's also really time consuming. Yeah. Um, but if Why, you can, did you have like people that to, like took your artists? I yes, I did. I had a lot of people who ended up being competitors. Ooh. Yeah. Sorry. Quite a few actually. Um, Quite and, a few. Wow. Sorry so, about that. <laughs> no, it's fine. You know. Um, but that's just that's people's nature you know yeah. I think uh, the way I came out on the other side of this was is a little bit and I hate to say this a little jaded mm -hmm. 
but I'm working on it. Like I don't yeah. want to be. I don't want to see people that way. I'm much more protective. I'm careful. I made a lot of mistakes um, because I'm because I approached it like with a certain generousness yeah. of my my, my soul. Um, because I was never doing it. I have a question. What sign moment. are you? I'm a Libra. Oh, you're a Libra. Okay. I thought you were a Scorpio for a second. No, I'm a Libra. Because I'm a Scorpio. You, the way you just said is so much like me. I uh-huh. was like, oh my God. This is so. so, yeah, that yeah. was. So, that, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm answering the question because it's a big question. It's like you go out, you do it, you try it, you, you do it slowly, you figure certain things out, you figure out how you're going to work with artists. You have to figure out the business of it, which can be really abstract sometimes. And there's so many questions. Yeah. I literally have a friend. I'm not going to say her name. She's in her early 40s. She has a gallery. And she's always calling me and going, Jonathan, what do I do about this? What do I do about this? And I'm like, how do you not know this yeah. by now? <laughs> With all the information on the internet, well, right? Well, it's also much easier to find information. But even if you were to read a book that says, this is how the gallery relationship works, it's it's just a generalization. It's not fact. Mm-hmm. It's In fact, it's like not it's not really a truth because it's gotta be per situation. Yeah. Um, but it's it's a difficult business. There was a way that it used to work that was pretty cut and dry, we all followed. Yeah. But it stopped working once people artists became more autonomous. Mm-hmm. It didn't make sense anymore. So did I answer your question? No, a hundred percent. Perfectly well. Not that I wanna say I think being in a running a gallery is really difficult if you don't have a lot of money. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You do what I did. You start putting on shows and bars. Yeah. If you want to make a living out of it, there's a lot of compromises you have to mm-hmm. make. I was really idealistic and slowly had to make more and more and more and more compromises. It's compromises I didn't particularly like, um, and it was difficult, but I kept doing it. So, are you glad that you did those, like the compromises? Yeah, I don't have any regrets. I'm in regards to my business as a whole at all. Like I set out to do a certain thing and I did it. And then the world changed. And even if I had a ton of money right now where I could just do whatever I want, I still wouldn't do it the same way. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I would really run a space. Yeah. Um, be- because I was doing it for a very specific reason. And it, and, and it, the reason I was doing it for is it w- there was a need. Mm-hmm. And now there isn't. So there was a need in the art world for yeah. someone like me. And now there isn't because me and a handful of other people and a lot of artists helped change that. So, And do you agree with that, or do you wish it was what it used to be? No, I think it's a good thing. I don't know. No, it, it is what it is. I mean, truth is, it's like it's really nice not to run a gallery because yeah. it's very difficult. Um, imagine you're producing, whenever I see, like, old competitors, they're still out there, and I know they're busting their ass, and, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm so I don't happy that's that lovely. Yeah, yeah. I was just looking at someone that I, you know was kind of a competitor, and I saw that they produced like 70 shows last year, and I was yeah. just like, oh my god, forget about it. I mean, just dealing with like one yeah. artist representing one artist is is enough, is enough for me, and uh, I'm not trying to prove anything with that. So you have to. There was a reason I did what I did, and it had a purpose. But yeah. once that purpose was no longer there because it was not needed. Yeah. It didn't make sense to do it anymore yeah. either. So well, I can understand what you mean. And when you started, um, did you have like a team of people? Or were you doing like everything from like front of the house and back of the house and kind oh. of running? Yeah, no, when I started, it was just me when I started. I oh, just, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, just myself. I mean, the first gallery, when I was curating independently, it was just me. Mm-hmm. I would show up and have to hang a show in four hours. No way. have like a toolbox, you know. Wow. It wasn't like, yeah. you know, I... Thick stuff would get shipped to my house. I'd pack it. It was super gorilla, super wow. DIY. I used to walk the streets and flyer for shows because you didn't promote it on the internet. Oh, wow. yeah, of course. I mean, you're lucky if you had a look, couple hundred dollars to make postcards. I was like, yeah. oh, that's super pro. And you just pass them out, right? Yeah. And then when I opened the first gallery, it was just me. And then I got a part time employee, 20 hours a week. Oh, wow. And then that person became a and I maybe had two part-time employees. So I had like That's a amazing. full-time employee. But I was busting my ass. And that was for about four years. And then when I moved to New York, I immediately got three employees. Oh, wow. And that for that then then from there on out I had anywhere from seven to ten employees. Oh wow. 
I had a whole team. Yeah. Um, and so then my job became about managing people, curating and managing. That's what I did. You know, it wasn't about, and, and it's, and I would manage the artists to some extent, but mm-hmm. you'd be surprised I wouldn't be with them as much because I didn't have the time. Yeah. So the business becomes, it, you become far, further and further away from it. Mm-hmm. And, it becomes this constant how can i generate money to cover all these costs yeah it doesn't become about this the passion in a way yeah not at all and it doesn't become about this sort of i mean my gallery was all about community so if people went there was this we were always sort of cultivating community the openings were always packed lots of people met it was like a scene yeah and that's what i was trying to create yeah and i did for a good 15 years you know oh, wow. it was a good run um were you always at every opening yeah. For the whole time of the opening? I ran, I owed, I'm trying to think, I, when when I finally closed the gallery, how many years had it been? 12, 13, 14, 15, 15, 17 years, I think it was. Oh, wow. I had missed one opening, but I hadn't really missed it. I had gone, we had a pre-opening the night before. Oh, okay. And I had to fly to LA for another opening. Yeah. That and I had to basically I produced a show every six weeks for like seventeen years. Oh wow, that's it was crazy! Such a grind. And do you think like the openings were kind of like a reward for you, like seeing all your sacrifices, your compromise, and everybody was there having a good time, having the community sense? I used to be really happy when I, after I'd done it for a while. Yeah. I was quite honestly, I was I didn't like my job that mm-hmm. much. Um, there's aspects I liked like about. Like when you became like the ma- more like managing part of the yeah, business. Yeah, and it's all the constant stress. Yeah. Like, did we make enough money to cover our rent? This, you know, all these costs that yeah. I had, you know. The employees. Yeah, yeah you like you'd have an opening if, and you were always happy that a lot of people showed up. But I got to a point where I didn't like dealing with the crowds because, yeah. I mean, literally I had this 4,000 square foot space and it would be packed wall to wall. And if anyone knew me, knew that I was probably hiding in my office drinking whiskey. Yeah. And because I got to the point where I just, I'm a little claustrophobic. I just didn't like it. It was too mm-hmm. much, and people were, you know, you're getting hustled. Yeah. And uh, part of me liked it, but other part of me made me really anxious. And but if people didn't show up, then I'd be bummed. Yeah. And another thing is, you could have a packed house and nothing selling. Nothing sells. So, wow. so like it was so stressful. It felt like gambling in a way. Oh, probably. the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's completely gambling. Yeah. It's totally like an addiction. Truth be told. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are in it for that reason. Mm-hmm. Um, but big risks, you get big rewards. Mm-hmm. So, do you ever have like an opening where everything was sold? Oh, many. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, I sold out many shows. And how was the rush for that? Were you like, oh, that was great? But the, here's the thing: is that people would always think, oh, that guy's rich. I was generating a lot of money, mm-hmm. but not for myself. Yeah. But then you could have, you know, two shows in a row where you lost a hundred grand. Yeah. So exactly. it's like. The numbers, well, you know, to have a space and have employees and all this. At one point, my overhead was a hundred thousand dollars a month, oh, wow. and so just to break even, you had two hundred thousand dollars a month in sales. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Yeah, that's a lot of stress. Yeah, and that, I didn't have parents giving me that money. That was just oh, yeah. making it all on my own, doing it all on my own, taking these risks. I wouldn't do that again. Yeah, I still have to take some risk, but. Well, that's a lot of stress. It is so stressful. And yeah. like, I never want to go through that again. Because I'm sure at a point you be- became like, okay, great. That's amazing for this month. How am I going to do this again? Well, yeah. I mean, I, the fact that I was able to sustain it for so long with, you know, I it is unusual. Yeah. Um, but the industry was changing and people were not staying. Artists that were becoming really successful were moving on to bigger galleries but then the other thing is artists that there was a lot of artists I worked with who weren't really exclusive to me and they were screwing up their markets. Mm-hmm. And it just became What do you mean by screwing up their markets? Uh they were raising their prices too much, they were making bad bodies of work. They were spreading themselves too thin. They were putting out too much merchandise. Mm-hmm. They weren't managing their careers properly, and they didn't want you to manage their careers because everyone's become some entrepreneurial. Everyone yeah. just wants to make money. Um, they're very different. There's an expectation that they're supposed to be able to make a good living. Yeah. And that's probably, if you look at all the artists in the world, 
and the amount of people that are going to buy art, that's probably not a very reasonable expectation, statistically, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that, but what was it? We were talking about, sorry, my jaw just cracked. Um, Oh my God, I suddenly had like a, a brain fart. No, we were talking about how, how the artist like um, manipulated their own career in a way. Well, I mean, you know, everybody does things their own way. And I, uh, one thing that always inevitably happens with almost every artist, there's a handful that don't. But the minute they start doing really well, they think that, oh, this is it, I'm fine. I think there's a narrative in people's heads, most people's heads, mm-hmm. that, that are artists that are, oh, I've been working so hard, I'm super talented, people have been telling me this, I'm finally going to be recognized and famous i think a lot of people do it for that reason they make the work because they love it but they desire fame so badly and um i get it because i kind of felt that way myself at yeah. one point. you know i just i'm not any i'm guilty you know um but then it starts taking off for them and they just think it's going to keep going and they don't realize like i'd always use the example of like bands right mm-hmm. rock i would use rock bands but like you know, if a band has a three album career that does really well, that's really successful. Yeah. You know, like I don't think of like Rage Against the Machine or I don't know, Limp Biscuit. I'm not saying these are their bands that I like, but I always use the idea of the hive and not the hives. The um, what was that band that came out in like 2000? The Killers out of New York. Out uh, of New York, New York City. Yeah, well, I can't think of what think of what the like rock and roll. Yeah, Garagey. They were huge, and everyone thought, like, I'm, I'm blanking on their name, but if I think of them, I'll, I'll say it. Everyone thought they were, like, the second coming of the Beatles or something, and they have this one record that's super great, and then it's quiet. They still do really yeah. well, but, like, there's so many one-hit wonders. Mm-hmm. There's so many... So, like, for an artist, most artists don't have don't have careers that last more successful careers a really successful artist it won't last more than 10 years there's statistics all sorts of statistics are you talking about visual arts or like musicians yeah, visual artists okay yeah. but you know it could, I would compare it to music as something people understand yeah so but people think oh I'm gonna be like Taylor Swift or something <laughs> or Michael Jackson I'm just like no it's yeah. it's a completely so different. Yeah, it's yeah, a completely yeah. different thing so people sort of mismanage their career their yeah. ego there are some artists that don't mm-hmm there's some artists that are smart. Yeah. And they're just like, that's cool. I'm right here. Yeah, and steady. Yeah. And then other artists, and then some artists have just, they're clueless. They have zero acclimate, business acclimate. And they're kind of like, yeah. oh, this is happening. Oh, it's working. And then it's not, oh, there's no did strategy. They, did they there. listen to you when you said, hey, you know, let's try to edit this? This may happen, or were they like, no, um, like mm, you said, I I'm the next Taylor Swift. No, Swithin, I think a lot of times people listen to you, but they're going to do what they want to do, yeah. and they're going <laughs> to screw things up. On yeah, their own. and they do, and then yeah. they come back and they go, oh, you were oh, right. Oh, you're right. But, Can we redo it? <laughs> but once you've sort of screwed it's things up, you know, you can't, you can't fix it. Yeah. The strokes. That's all the, the strokes. Okay. I was thinking that's who it was. The strokes. The strokes. Um, I was using an example because they had that one album. There was like, oh, they're so great, and then like afterwards they were not as big but they yeah. you would have thought they were going to be like the next Beatles you know yeah. um but yeah and then they're very successful so i just think people have it in their really really incredibly unrealistic expectations mm-hmm. as a whole it's just the yeah. and i think if you work with successful artists which i did that were it's the ones that are successful are ones that are like very aggressive very entrepreneurial very motivated so you're already you're getting these people it's not like you're you're starting with people at yeah. that because you need that yeah um so that's a piece of it too you know um even like some of this artist i work with kum kum if you're watching this kum kum i'm not disrespecting you <laughs> <laughs> shout out to him is he the shout one that Kung had Kung. the the sculpture at coachella yes. the big one yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. I was like, uh, that name sounds familiar. Because he's like relatively young. He's like, I mean, not, he's like 37. He thinks he's like old. I'm like, you're a kid. Um, but, you know, we're we're building him and he's doing really well. And I'm always like. Steady. You know, I'm just like, yeah. come on. I'm like, and I always like say, I'll, I'll say, uh, remember these words. And I'll say them like three times. Remember mm-hmm. these words. Sometimes I'll take a video. Because like, he lives in, he's either in Vietnam 
or in Germany or sometimes in Sri Lanka. So we talk almost every day oh, wow. on through yeah. the you know the computer, yeah. Zoom or whatever you know. Yeah. And I like bring out my phone. I'm like, I'm going to make a video of this conversation. I'm going to save it for later. You know? uh. <laughs> but he and I have such a personal relationship. That's one of the good things about just like working with a small group of artists is that you can be much more involved and help them more. Whereas mm. if you're working with a lot of artists and you're just churning out shows, you can't do that as yeah. much. Yeah. So. And you mentioned you're, you play drums. That's correct. Are you, are you like retired now that you're going to like be at the next rock star? Is that your goal? <laughs> <laughs> I wish that's cool. I love, I love drumming. Like that's always been my favorite instrument. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. No, this is something I get really. I'm in a band. We're called Cyclone Static, and we're just like a. Do you I guys do shows? Yeah, yeah, sure. We're oh. playing down the street. Uh, no way. You know the pet shop. By Newark Ave. Yeah, it's yeah. on the corner of Newark and Jersey. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we play there on Thursday, December fourteenth. December. 14th, yeah, we Thursday. play out like once a month. You know, we'll play oh, dope. here. We'll play North Jersey. We'll play the beach. We'll play Brooklyn, Manhattan. We'll play Philly. Um, but we're like we have we're on a record label. We That's ha- so cool. we have an album out and a four song EP. Um, What's the share the name so we can stream your your music? So my band's name is Cyclone Static, and you can find us on any streaming platform: Spotify, Apple Music. Amazon, Pandora. Uh, yeah, I guess whatever, whatever. Yeah, iHeartRadio. Everything, yeah. everything, yeah. right? Because we're distributed because we're on a small yeah. label. Um, but we also, right now, the big exciting thing for me wa- is that we got a song on Fortnite, the video No game. way. That's huge. I know. That's like, wow. It's, it's like being on the radio. Yeah. So that's been happening for about a month now. Uh, we're seeing a big uptick. So I'm kind of wondering what's going to happen with that. I mean, hey, listen, if I had my way... We'd be on tour and yeah, all that. I was that. about to say, you guys should go on tour. I'd like to, but the problem is that my bandmate, who's the singer songwriter, is like basically my creative. He's my collaborator. Uh-huh. You know? I mean, we have other. We have another band member, my bass, our bass player, but uh, he hasn't been with us that long. The band is really me and James oh, wow. Salerno, but he's like a creative director at yeah. um, Viacom. Oh wow! And he's like married. He's got like yeah. three kids and. Oh wow! All that stuff. So, That's so cool. <laughs> unless you know we're making a ton of money, yeah, he can retire. Suddenly, yeah, you know, and we can go out and tour and make money. Yeah, it's just be, it continues just to be more of a local thing. And did you always play drum like throughout all your career as an art dealer? N- uh, not exactly. I mean, I've been playing since I was a little kid. Okay, but I stopped playing. So that was I was playing in a band in the '90s when I was curating with the same guy. We had a yeah. different band. No, and it was oh, a wow. New York band. And he lived in Brooklyn. He lives in Jersey now. He's yeah. one of my friends. Who grew up in New York? Oh wow! Who moved to oh, Jersey, no, really. just like all the others? Yeah. That I have. James Salerno. He grew up in Gravesend. People don't even even know where that is, but that is a a neighborhood next to Bensonhurst mm-hmm. in Coney Island. Oh wow! Okay, so grew up in a super Italian American neighborhood. That's so right? cool. So he lives out in Cranford now. Um, what was I saying about this? What did you ask me? I was asking if you always had a, a musical oh, career. So we played in this band in the 90s, and when I turned 30, yeah. I stopped playing. That's when I lived down the street from here. And then I opened my business because I didn't have time. Yeah. So I couldn't. Not even like hobby or anything? A little bit. I had a drum set in my basement. I'd, have, I'd go down and play every so often, but then yeah. I didn't. And then probably around nine years ago, maybe could have been even 10 maybe just nine i don't know how many years ago it was he and i hadn't spoken for a while and i saw him on facebook and i was like what are you doing he's like so we 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 met in the city we're both working in the city and we had drinks he's like you playing he's like not really i was like you want to play he's like okay so we just started getting together like once a week just for friends and writing songs took a couple years That's so cool. and then we started playing out and then we got picked up by a record label and we just started doing it again it's really about our friendship and and do you guys like write songs collectively like yeah sort of like well not exactly i mean he's really the primary singer songwriter he played mm-hmm. guitar and sings he'll sometimes come in with a full-blown idea sometimes he'll come into a with a piece a lot of times he and i are just jam on ideas and come mm-hmm. up with stuff and build a song on the spot Oh, so nice. we do a combination of things and then eventually 
I write my parts, and then we go, what do we need? And then we sort of collectively work on a song. He's predominantly the songwriter. And then when we're ready, we go and record and we release music. That's so cool. Yeah. And do you have to go through like the label? Do they have to approve anything? Or? No, it's not like that. It's such a small label. Basically, we just put out as much music as we want whenever we oh, want wow. to. So, um, you know, and that's a whole process as well. You know, recording music. Yeah. We recorded the last these four songs that we just released a couple months ago uh, here in Jersey City with a guy in a place called C- the Cocoon. Is that what he calls it? It's a guy Corey Zach. He's a local engineer, producer, music producer. He's got oh, a good nice. studio. Um, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's fun. Wow, you're full of talent. I like that. You know what? I'm just trying to have fun. Yeah. You know, like I'm just trying to like do what I do for a living have fun with it i'm still getting to travel a lot yeah. i'm still being engaged but i do it on, on my own terms mostly and i do it with a lot less stress and a lot less pressure it's not as exciting mm-hmm. i work from home it's yeah. a little lonely sometimes um but do you ever let me pause you on that because i feel the same way sometimes but do you ever think oh my god i could have to be like i could be could be commuting right now in the tunnel to and from New York City right oh, now. Oh, yeah, I don't want to do Do you ever that. have that quick thought? Oh, I, you know, it's funny because I... Where you I, think like, oh, I'm so long, and then I'm like, oh, it could be worse. I, I looked at uh, a space I remember at one point because uh, I was going to do a pop-up and the woman, who's this, this realtor I know who just rents the galleries, um, she showed me this space and it was really cheap and I kind of had a man. I was like, oh, maybe I should... It was a small space. It was yeah. in my old building. It wasn't very expensive. It was just like right after COVID started uh-huh. opening up a little. I was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I drove in the city, and then I parked my car and parked back, and I was like, I, wait, I can't. No. I can never do this again. <laughs> the same for me. I could do it if, in a gallery that's close to my house or something yeah. like that, but location is really important. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. so that's, you know. And if I did run another space, I just want to go in a couple of days. Mm-hmm. You have to have really good staff. And yeah. All. Essentially, you have to have a lot of money. Yeah. And you have to be able to lose it. Yeah. And I don't really need a space. I can just do a pop up every once in a mm-hmm. while. I mean, it's a little bit of work and stuff. And I have I have employees. I have mm-hmm. an employee um, who works remotely for me. And if I need to hire someone to do a pop up, I can do that. I have those resources. Um, but I don't even approach those things unless I think that there is going to be a lot of money coming. Yeah, because it, it's not worth it. Because it has to be an investment, right? Yeah, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Just, it's not just an investment, a financial investment. It's time and energy that yeah. I could be doing something else. Yeah. So if I don't think it's going to generate a lot of income, I don't do it. And I'm not. A, I'm at a point in my life where I have to really think about that because I have. To, I'm getting older, and I'm trying to save enough money so I can retire at some mm-hmm. point. Not that that could be 15, 20 years from now, but. That's not that long from now. Do you plan to retire like as soon as you you feel like it, or I don't know that I'll ever retire because mm-hmm. I just work. I mean, yeah. just because I, I I think that I may even make more money when I'm super old. Because one of the things that's interesting about my business is as long as I'm as long as I am, uh, you know, active and people know I'm active. People and the people know I resell work. Collectors yeah. will constantly come to me, and as my collectors age out and they start yeah. to either. Uh, Unfortunately. I mean, truthfully, a lot of them are going to be dying yeah. when I'm because they're 10, 20 years yeah. old. So you, their kids are going to show up with collections and be like, like, can hey, you sell this? Can you do this for me? So truth is, I'll probably make more yeah. money then than I do now, which is fine by me. Yeah. You know, it's kind of a weird situation. Scenario, yeah. scenario. It'd be like, oh, you're going to make more money when you get yeah. older. Unless something, unless there's no world, you know, but yeah. if, as long as there is. You're good. <laughs> yeah. And when you go to, like, art places, galleries, museums, are you able to, like, look at art and enjoy it? Or do you get, like, do you think from, like, a business mindset, like, oh, how, I wonder, like, you know what I mean? I wonder, it's a, I'm good, it's a good question. It's hard for me to enjoy it. I, yeah. It's funny because with this, this, my ex-girlfriend for a very long time, and she'd always be like, let's go to the Whitney or let's go to this. And I would just go because she yeah. wanted to go because she didn't experience the art world. Yeah. I mean, basically spend my whole day looking at art and, yeah. and, and understanding it. But when I would go, I would enjoy it. You know, if we go to Whitney or the MoMA or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't really go out of my way to go see exhibitions. It really triggers me in a very negative way. Galleries more so. Galleries. So like big institutions is kind of like yeah, chill. Yeah, if I feel like yeah. it. You know, I, you know, I just, if I feel like it, uh, I'd rather truthfully go for a drive in some like out in the country. And yeah. Yeah. 
or like go to some little gallery and when I go to small cities, I always find a little kooky gallery. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's more my scene. Yeah. Um, or just odd creative spaces. What happens to you when you go to like a gallery now? I get anxious. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I think I just know too much about the business. Yeah. You know, and, and what it is. And it, so for me, it's a very different experience than it is for, for, for other people. Mm-hmm. So I, it's not that I don't go, but I just, don't go so often yeah yeah oh well that's kind of like a blessing and a curse in a way yeah it's been that way for a while though it was like that for me when i was in the business as well so but it's fine because i'm but i was always kind of that way Mm -hmm. i mean even i mean when i was really young i started going to galleries and i before i owned my own business i was like this is lame (laughs) <laughs> I got to make a cooler space. Than yeah, this. yeah. Um, but I want to experience art in a different way than this. Mm-hmm. Uh, it constantly being commodified, even though it's kind of what I do. But I don't always experience. I don't want to experience it that way. Yeah. You know, I'd rather drive through Newark. Yeah. And look at old architecture. Yeah. And what do you think of, uh, like, the future of art? Do you think, like, galleries will disappear and you just have, like, Christie's and auction houses in there? No, I don't think that'll happen. I think there will always be galleries. I think it's a tough business. Most galleries don't last more than 10 years. You'll still have the mega galleries. People have really deep pockets dealing with the very small percentage of artists that are super successful because they're being invested into. And you always have people who want to show art because they're passionate about it and they're just doing it and... um, struggling with it because it's a hard business it'll always yeah. be there but um mid-level galleries have been pushed out completely um and you know like that's so say if you want to be a young gallerist and you're kind of a purist you're going to have to scrap it out and it's yeah. probably not going to be very lucrative and you may have an artist you make some money off of but as soon as the artist starts doing really well i can guarantee you that artist is going to jump because they're going to want more yeah they always do. People are ambitious. Yeah. So. And there's no way to do like um. Like a non compete, like there's no way for, as a gallerist to like have an artist that you're kind of like sign on. You know, like how music like record yeah, labels do course. with artists. I do that, but it's only going to last so long. Yeah. And a lot of artists don't want to sign contracts. Yeah. Like back then or now, what do you think? Now more so than now ever. more so. Yeah. But I, I always, I always had that issue. A lot of the artists that I work with didn't want to sign contracts. They were like very successful already, and they're like no. And so that was one of the things I had to deal with. Um, but I really won't work with an artist if they don't sign a contract. Yeah, that's like such a liability. But most galleries, that was the way it was all done. A hand, it was a handshake deals. So. Yeah, and did, like I didn't like ten out of ten did everybody like follow through? No. And, no. <laughs> No, not at all. People say oh, this. Wow. I'll say this right now. They always talk about how gallants are scumbags, blah, 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 which is – it's a bad stereotype. There are a lot of scumbag gallants, a lot of just very imperfect people in the mm-hmm. business. It's a very hard business. But so many artists don't do what they're supposed to all the time. Yeah. But if you were to say, oh, artists are scumbags or blah, 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 I wouldn't say that. I mean, I yeah. don't think that. But they really don't keep their – oftentimes they don't keep their word. Mm-hmm. I mean – you have artists just cancel shows on you like three months before. And what do you do? Like, do you have you to just fill it in? You scramble to put together a show. Or you have artists promise you a show and they don't give it to you. You have artists sign the contracts. What, are you going to sue them? Like, the only time you would actually do that is if there was so much money on the that table. Was lost, yeah. Like, so the, much. Yeah. That it would be, it would literally have to be. At least in the hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Or you wouldn't even touch it because at the end of the day, if you were to go to do this and the stuff that people don't really talk about, you would just look bad. Yeah. Like you the just, big guys going after the small guy. That's know. right. Like if I had ever sued any artists, I, there was an artist I worked for a long time who basically broke agreements. And I know, and he actually probably owed me half a million dollars worth of work. And I didn't go after him because he was so emotionally unstable it would have really affected him in a yeah. very very negative way and i didn't need to do that yeah and nothing good was going to come out of it yeah 
you know that's funny you say that because there's a big artist that i used to intern when like when i was like 19 20 i remember when his friends came to the studio and i always heard oh galleries are mean they're just one money just one money and like a lot of his friends will come and be like oh why are you still with this gallery why don't you go to a bigger gallery He's like, no, because I gave a, I gave this person my word. And they'd be like, please, like, I took my advance and I left. You know, and I remember thinking, like, wait, people mm. do that? Yeah, no, I would venture to say, I'd venture to say that nine, who it nine, is ta- no, no, okay. <laughs> nine times out of ten, artists are going to bounce to another gallery yeah. uh, if they're going to get more. Because they're all yeah. ambitious. They're no different. But there's a, a narrative about artists about how pure they are and this, that, and the other thing. And blah. But I'm not here to badmouth artists. Mm-hmm. They're just ambitious people. And the narrative is on their side, not on the side of the gallerist. That's yeah. just the way it is. Um, that's why you have to really pick your artist wisely, yeah. have really hardcore contracts, have a good relationship with them, really talk to, talk to them about why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you know, that's what happens. There is very, very few businesses that there's so much money and risk involved and you're putting all the, if you had $50,000, you wouldn't dump it into an artist for a body of work that you're going to have to give back to them after a couple months, yeah. six months or something. It's ridiculous. It's a bad investment. Yeah. If you don't know for sure that it's going to sell and you have no say over what they're going to make, yeah. um, that's the industry. Um, and it's, you know, they always say this about the music industry. Oh, the music industry is a bunch of such a bunch of scumbags are making all this money, blah, blah. And there's probably some truth to that. But there's also the truth is the music industry is dumping tons and tons of money into tons and tons of other artists. And they're losing millions of dollars. On yeah. I lost hundreds. I lost millions of dollars over a period of 17 years on artists. Millions. And I didn't say, oh, well, I don't say anything about it. Are you able, I don't know if legally, but like, could you ever... Would you ever be able to like recoup that? No. Like just like send an email, like, hey, can I get like the ten no, pieces? No, because that that wasn't the deal. Would you even care to do that? No, not really. No. And listen, that's not the deal. That's yeah. not how the business was set up. Is everything's done on consignment? You basically produce a show, you get X amount of work for X amount of time to sell it. You promote a market. If it doesn't sell, they get it back. I don't want to work that way. Yeah. That's not a wise way to work, in my opinion. This is what I say these days. It used to work because you didn't have so much competition mm-hmm. and artists didn't have any as many options and yeah. they weren't as autonomous. They had to rely on you. So you could be like that. But the minute they started to being more autonomous, that didn't work anymore. And nobody wants to be locked down yeah. unless you're get Larry Gagosian knocking on their door and you have something really a lot to offer. Yeah. But if you're a mid-level gallery or an up, you know, sort of a younger gallery, they're not going to give you that unless you can really hand them a lot of money and nobody has that kind of money. Yeah. I was just having this conversation with the artist Ron English. I don't know if you know who he is. I think so. He's a kind of a famous pop artist, a good friend of mine. I was just saw him this weekend. We were having this conversation. We are debating. He's like, well, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I was having this conversation with the wife, too, because she, man- she, she managed him. And she's a very, very smart woman. She's very, very smart. Tarsa English. But even when I said to her, she was like, mm. she didn't say anything back to me. Because it's one thing I can argue is the economics of the industry and the way it was set up and how it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And n- artists don't want to hear that because it's not in their favor. Yeah. So when I talk to people, oftentimes I'll, people ask me, occasionally they get really deep into it. They're like, well, why don't you do this? And why don't you do that? And I'm like, because would you do that? Would you do this? And I lay it out for them. I'm like, no. Well, then why the hell should I do it? Yeah. You know, it doesn't make any sense. It's yeah. not a good financial arrangement so you know i just deal with my particular projects and the particular artists that i work with in a very particular way and i say if you want to work with me this is how we have to do it otherwise i'm not interested that makes sense yeah you're pretty fair i like that you're like one of a kind Seriously. about that thanks i appreciate it <laughs> um and moving forward do you have anything like any current projects you're working on yeah uh what do i have coming up some stuff I can't really talk about, mm-hmm. um, but I do have a project with Kum Kum Fernando. Okay. We're going to be in Miami for the art fairs. I don't know how much I'm allowed to say about this. This December? Yes. Okay. We are releasing something, an addition, at an event, but I'm not allowed to talk about it, but mm-hmm. it's going to be really a cool. A sneak peek is good enough. Yeah. It's going to be really cool. That's all? Maybe I work with this artist. Um, 
Mark Dukes. Uh, I think we might be doing an online show when he's ready. He lives in Thailand, but he's American. He's got a book coming out, Fantagraphics. Um, I'm probably doing a pop-up show in Seattle with an artist I've worked with over the years um, named Michael Leavitt. Yeah, I kind of don't know. Yeah. I have a big sale happening, uh, online store sale happening, Black Friday. On your I, website? Yeah. Yeah? yeah so do you want to share your website just so people can go check it out? It's www.jonathanlevineprojects.com, and you can also find us on Instagram and Facebook. Perfect. And then do you want to plug in your Instagram too while we're at it? It's the same. Jonathan Levine Projects. Perfect. Thank you for listening to Tariq Talk. Follow Tariq Talk on all social media channels and check out the video interviews online.